The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning. We started well, good, with good, <laughs> good morning. morning to you. Uh, uh, it's, it's, sorry, I it's forgot. It's still morning for you. It um, is still morning for us. And uh, welcome, everybody. We started, we, we, we've had technical difficulties this morning. We started to play the opener for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, which is what Fridays are. We've had all kinds of te technical difficulties today. And so unfortunately, Nancy can't join me, but I am Shannon Penrod. And you can see who is joining me here. It is the fabulous Eustacia Cutler. And we are so over the moon excited to have her here today. She is going to be here with us, with you and I, for the next hour live. She's got a lot that she wants to tell us and some questions that you guys had sent in earlier in the week that she is going to go over and it's going to be an hour, one for the record books, right? Uh, but I just want to tell all of you as we start here, there's lots of ways to connect and watch the show. And somebody already has just written in you station said they just bought your book, A Thorn in My Pocket. And for those of you who have not read that, please make sure that you do. Uh, we're going to give you some information throughout the show about how you can connect with uh, some of the things that Eustacia has done, but A Thorn in My Pocket is a must, must, must read. So uh, thank you and congratulations. Uh, I want to tell people, um, and we're going to tell this a couple of times, but if you're looking, I know when we had Temple on on Tuesday, we were talking about how it is difficult to get some books quickly, but if you order directly from the publisher, you can go to fhautism.com, go to Future Horizons, and not only can you order books, uh, and, and hear what some of the things that Eustacia has said and some of the things that Temple has said, but you'll find information about an upcoming event that's happening with Eustacia uh, in honor of Mother's Day. So check that out. It's coming up on May 8th. So, but Eustacia, you're here, and this is such an honor for us, and um, I, I just, I can't say enough um, how thrilled I am to have you here as a mom of an individual who was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, it's, a, it's just an extra special treat to hear you and hear your words. So I'm gonna shut up and let you talk because I know that there's a lot of things that you wanted to share with us this morning, but I'm here with you and I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> well, thank you and good morning. And it's a delight to be with you via Zoom. Uh, we live in a very difficult time right now. And the first rule that I learned 70 years ago when I was raising Temple in a much easier time is that there are no answers. There are only choices, but choices can be changed and you will change them and you will be changed by them. So you better just embroider that on a pillow and sleep on it every night. And know too that there's hope. We learn and we change both us and our children. And that means as time goes on, we make better choices. I think of the words of science writer, Matt Ridley. He said, the genes are not the implacable little determinists. We thought they were. The way their promoters turn on and off is entirely determined by external experience. An external experience is us. Also, our children are open to life, experience, and it will affect them. Never underestimate the value of education. 
And that being so, I'm going to start with a little education before we get to your questions. What is it, first of all, that we can do that our children can't do? It looks easy. Shannon, you and I have been talking to each other, feel social, feel spontaneous. But actually, most of it is neurological. And this is what our children lack. It's either not in their neurology or it's skewed, or maybe it's both. And the, what's lacking? The best illustration, and I've told it over and over, but it's so exact. I'm going to tell it again. It's about my youngest grandson, Nicholas. My, I have only grandsons. I have five, and they're all grown men now. But Nicholas was a baby then. He was a baby just beginning to talk. And the first words that his grandmother heard him say were not mama, dada, but Oreo. He pointed to the cookie jar and he said Oreo. We all laughed, but I knew that that meant his neurology was complete. This is what he had that a lot of our children don't have. First of all, conceptual thinking, the idea of something. Nicholas understood the idea of what a cookie is for. Now you can say to an autistic child, point to the shovel. He could point to it. But if you say, what are you pointing to? Dig, what, point to the thing you dig with. He's lost. He doesn't have the idea of what a shovel does. And he doesn't know, therefore he can't generalize. He doesn't know that his father's snow shovel and his little sandbox shovel are both shovels. He can't generalize. And I, the best example I can think of that is a young man that I know today who's about 30. Now, he lives here in New York City, and he's learned that he can cross the street when the light's green, and he can't cross the street when the light's red. So he, he knows enough on the streets right around where he lives. He's memorized them. What he can't do is understand that all streets operate the same way. All general, he cannot generalize that all red and green lights mean the same thing. That limits him to the neighborhood where he's memorized the lights. Now, the next thing that Nicholas could do was context. Where are we? He understood already that he was in his high chair where he got things to eat. And if he wanted a cookie, he better speak up fast before somebody took him out of that place. Our children do not understand context. They cannot deal with prepositions. Temple had a lot of trouble with prepositions, understanding over, under, around, in between. They don't see the relationship of us to where we are, or one object to another, or even one idea to another. They don't understand relevance. Again, I think of a really smart Asperger man who can do all of these things. You see, what, what our children are very good at is logic and memory. He can memorize anything. He can, he can do mathematical genius work, but he cannot understand context. And therefore, he's stuck driving a taxi cab. Now, the next thing Nicholas could do was shared information. He understood that we had a different mind from his. 
and he would get the idea of a cookie from his mind into our minds. And how did he do it? He looked at us and he pointed to the cookie jar. He didn't look at the cookie jar. He looked at us. He understood that's the way you share information. All this had taken place in a baby before he could barely talk. Now, at the moment, I... It's so, excuse me, I just dropped a page on the floor. Hold on. Well, and while you're getting that, Eustacia, I just want to acknowledge that a lot of people have already started writing in and saying hello to you and sending you messages of love, um, saying oh. how much they love Future Horizons, that Future Horizons writes great blogs. Um, and they're just the world is saying hello to you and saying you're such an incredible mother and advocate for um, for all of us and for Temple and um, uh, that you inspire them. So I just wanted to share that, that right. everybody, somebody said, hi, beautiful mom. Uh, so uh, it is so wonderful to be able to see you. So uh, in a way, I'm glad your page dropped. So we had an opportunity for those people to spread some love on you. Well, that's, thank you, thank you. And it means everything to me. I. I think of all the people that have helped me all of my life and Temple's life, and I was too young and too dumb to know to thank them. I can only thank them today by trying to do some of what they gave me when Temple was growing up. It's beautiful. The last, the, 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 I just want to get this last point in yes. because time always things yes. go, takes more time than we wish it did. Yes. Executive function. Nicholas could put it all together and act on it. Now, part of the problem, oh yeah, this is what I wanted to say is autism sees everything, but they don't see how it connects. And they can, they see the chairs, the floor, the podium, all in separate detail. And they can recall those details better than we can. They're great at memory and logic, but they can't put the details together meaningfully. So they memorize what's happened and figuring that tomorrow they'll know how to do it. Tomorrow's different. And the difference is not logical. There's no way to put the scene together the way it was yesterday. And this is why a lot of our children are rigid. They're trying to make the moment stand still. It doesn't stand still. And that's why it's important as much as we can to establish daily consistency and expectation. It helps anchor them. Now, I know you all want to know about Temple and you want to hear some answers to questions. And the first question that was on the list you gave me, Sharon, was uh, what was the worst moment? <clears throat> this leads up to it. Temple was born in 1947. As a baby, she was mute and she had a strange stare that didn't connect. She couldn't make eye contact. She couldn't play peekaboo and she didn't want to be touched. She'd pull away when I tried to hug her. Instead, she'd like to spit and go into gales of crazy laughter. At two, I took her to Children's Hospital in Boston to Dr. Bronson Crothers. Now, Temple, there she was, this is the day of the big weep. They kept Temple there at Children's Hospital for 10 days observation. I went home and I wept as I have never wept again. I thought I was going to strangle on my own tears. I woke up the next morning and I realized tears were stopping me from thinking. I would never cry like that again. 
I would use these moments to think and figure out. It's very important, or it was to me. I never have cried like that again. I've tried to stop each moment, figure it out as best I could, and work from what I knew at that particular time. At the end of these 10 days, Dr. Carruthers said, she's autistic. And he proposed not, now we get into the Temple Grandin movie, these questions all overlap. Uh, what was the worst of the movie and what was the best of it? Well, one of the worst, the Temple always says, oh, mother hates that scene. I do. It was the scene where the doctor recommended institutionalizing Temple and that I stood up against him. Not only was it not what I did, so it wasn't true, it was also ludicrous. I don't know who wrote it, but in 1949, women didn't have any rights of any kind. And I was a little girl of 22 who didn't know anything and had a child with autism. Do you think I could have spoken up against a, the medical, the whole medical profession, which was all male? I couldn't have. We couldn't even get a charge card without a father's permission or a husband's permission. Now, this also applies to the people who help Temple. Dr. Carruthers told me who to take Temple to for speech lessons. And it was a Mrs. Reynolds. And she had a little school in her basement. Now, that was the day. Today, she would be the director of an established and funded school. Then she was just a woman. Women were allowed to teach, uh, to be nurses, and to be stenographers. That's all we were allowed. This school, it did exist. And Dr. Carruthers knew it existed, which is part of the miracle of going to him. When you, uh, one of the things you asked is what helped most in raising Temple? Luck. And at least keeping my mind on the situation so that I could recognize my luck when it came along. And as soon as I met Mrs. Reynolds and took Temple to her little school, I knew we, I knew we were on a good track. It took Temple three years to learn to talk. And as you all know, it hasn't stopped talking ever since. <laughs> so, <laughs> but she learned something else equally important. There were other children in the class and she saw herself for the first time in relation to other people, other people her own age. And a doctor years later said to me, do you realize that was as important a lesson as learning to speak? Now, what was I gonna say? Yes, and Temple had to learn, now we, we get into rules. How did I teach her rules? Some of them, she had to learn other ways. And one of them was she had to wait her turn to be helped by Mrs. Reynolds. And Mrs. Reynolds took them into a separate room, those who needed help. And Temple learned then that rule. And it was a big, she was only two. And my point is, the younger you learn these things, the longer, the younger the child is before the autism pattern is fully established you're getting started another pattern, a better one. Now, I didn't understand that when I was taking it there, but I kind of began to get a feeling about it. And I began to make other choices for Temple's future, better choices. A great thing about choices is if they don't work, 
choose something else. There's no hard and fast rule. Now, again, this is 1949. These accomplished women had all knew each other and they'd worked simple solutions out. Mrs. Reynolds told me to take Temple to Mrs. Huckle. Mrs. Huckle ran a little summer camp for children on the autism spectrum. Temple stayed there three days a week and she liked it, it worked. And she began again, there were other children there, they played together, this wasn't a lesson. They, they played games together. She began to understand how to be part of a group. And Mrs. Huckle said, I think Temple could be mainstreamed at five if you've got a little country day school and they understood her history. I took Temple to Dedham Country Day School. We lived in Dedham, Mass, about a half hour outside of Boston. And it was the little country day school that all the neighborhood children went to. I told them the story to Mr. Ladd, who was the president, the, what do you call them then? He was the head of the school. And to Mrs. Teach, who was head of the pre-K through third grade department. They listened to the story. Now, here's where parents come in. This is, Mr. Ladd said to me, we will take Temple because we think we can work with you. We have turned down other parents, other children, because we didn't think we could work with the parents. It's a, it's a joint journey. And all of it is on the job training. Now, and what happened then with Mrs. Deach? She and I talked almost every day. And this meant that Mrs. Deach knew what happened at home. I knew what happened at school. It held Temple to expectation. She began to realize what was expected from her. And it also held her to consistency. Again, it grounded her. Expectation and consistency. And Temple was happy in the school. This were the children in the neighborhood where she lived. And she began to play with them. Now, there were days when Temple couldn't manage school. And Mrs. Teach would call me and say, can you come and get her, take her home? Yes. And she used those times to explain to the other children in the class about autism. So now that they're all in their 70s, they feel they had a role in bringing up their famous friend, Temple Grandin. So, now, the other thing that Temple learned was, I have to play games by the other children's rules. Otherwise, they won't let me play. Now, when I talked to the woman who does Sesame Street, she said, oh, that's terrible. I said, no, you don't understand. This is the way we play hide and seek. This is the way we play capture the flag. Games have rules. If you don't want to play the game, fine, don't play it. But if you want to join the game, these are the rules of the game. And Temple learned at five years old, I have to play the games the way the other kids play them, or they won't let me play. Now, children, are, girls, are more social than boys are who have, uh, Temple wanted to be with the children. Sometimes you've got autistic children, generally a boy doesn't care whether he's part of the group. She wanted it, was a big step forward. 
I don't know how you make children want it who don't want it. That is it. Now, Temple was happy at Dedham. I'm, where's my list of questions? Because I have other questions. That takes care of the darkest moment. I'm saving the sibling question for the end. Uh, the movie. Oh, I know what I wanted to tell you about the movie. Uh, yes, there was that fake scene. There were other scenes that weren't true. But Julia Orman played me in the movie. And she had read the book that you just mentioned, A Thorn in My Pocket. And that comes from a story that I picked up from a teacher I had at Harvard who was a close friend of Robert Frost. And I told him I was nervous coming back to college late in life. And he said his friend Robert Frost was nervous about lecturing, which he took too late in life and wasn't comfortable with it. And Frost said to him, I always carry something in my pocket I can touch when I'm talking, so I'll remember who I am. Lately, it's been a thorn. That's where the title of the book comes from. And Julia said to me, every scene I played, I kept a thorn in my pocket. Now she won an Emmy and she gave it to me. And to, which was, I, does anybody give up something like that? I, I finally decided we have to give this to a big autism organization that is uh, in White Plains outside of New York. It's part of the big uh, medical conglomeration of New York City. And we both agreed this was the place where it should go. So they put it in a beautiful glass case with the story beside it. and. Mothers come and they touch the cakes. They look at it and they remember the story. So that's the very good part of the movie. She and I, Julia and I, have been close friends ever since. That's the movie. Oh yeah, how did I get Temple to listen and obey? Uh, this was not as hard again because it was started early. You see, these patterns, these rules, which began to be established at two before she was old enough to rebel against me or hit me, as many autistic children do, they hit their mothers. Uh, the school also had rules, and, and that includes, there's a question in here about manners. That's what I wanted to include. Uh, wait a sec. It was, I think it was simply, simply how, did, how, how did you how get her to care about manners? How you did know? I get it? That was it, you're right. How did I get her to care about manners? For one thing, it was a more mannered culture. For another, we all ate together. And that included lunch at the school. And the, they sat at a little table. They all, the teacher sat at the head of the table. They all ate. They all had to have manners. The teacher saw to it. We don't do that now. And it's a loss. One hot day, Tevil came home and she said to me, oh, I can't stand the way Johnny Archibald eats. He opens his mouth. It looks like a old dump, dump truck with all that food rolling around. And I said, well, now you know why I ask you to close your mouth. Yep, she's closed her mouth. And she saw how the others responded. Children were used to eating together as a family. I, I'm not sure that happens all the time now. We have instant food. We didn't have instant food. We prepared it and this is the meal and we will all sit down together and eat it. Now, Temple was happy at Dedham Country Day School, but it only went through the sixth grade. And 
now we got into problems of a new school because when we're into beginning of adolescence and all children are struggling with adolescence. Nature gives them a new body and new friends and new clothes and strange new feelings. Temple could no longer manage and she didn't behave well. Again, the, the crazy laughter, what she thought was funny, wasn't funny to the other children. She took all their clothes when they were at gym and mixed them up in different lockers. But now it was a girl's school and all these little girls had new clothes. They also had no way to get to their next class because they couldn't find their clothes. Not surprisingly, they were angry at Temple and yelled at her and Temple hit one of them with a book. A perfectly usual spat between adolescent girls and of no consequence. But the headmaster of that school came after Temple and I know this by heart. Temple answered the phone as all children did in those days. They loved the phone. And the headmaster, instead of saying, Temple, may I speak to your mother? He said to her, you are a menace to society. Don't come back after Christmas vacation. An appalling thing for a, a grown man to do to a child. What was that compared to hitting a child with a book? Two little arguing girls of 12? It presented a problem. And again, the question of what has, what helped most in Temple's life? We got luck again. By some lucky coincidence, I was working on a documentary on autism for WGBH in Boston. And I had visited all the special schools from Maine down through Rhode Island. Now, what's always interested me is why didn't this school that Temple was in know about these schools? There were uh, quite a few of them in Cambridge. They should have known. They're educators, it's their job to know. So if I sound angry, I am. It makes me angry just to tell it all over again. It was, but I saw these different country schools. So what I did was I picked out three schools that I thought were really very good. And I said to Temple, you and I will go look at them and we'll, you can decide which school you'd like to go to. Why was I in such a hurry? I knew that Temple would be shunned. There's one thing worse than being bullied and that's being shunned. I thought, I'm getting her out of here, out of this town fast before that can happen. Well, Temple picked uh, Hampshire Country School. Again, it was in the country, and this time it was a farm, and there were horses. And those days, Temple was crazy about horses. And she chose Hampshire Country School, a very good school run by a wonderful man. Now, she did, I, oh yeah, the first two years there, she did no academic work of any kind. And I was worried about that. And Henry Patey, who ran the school said, don't worry about it. When she gets through adolescence, she will get back her mind, let it go. But he held her to chores, very good ones. If she liked horses so much and wanted to ride them, she would clean, clean their stables, she would feed them. She would take care of all their needs. Now here's where the question which came up about death. It hadn't happened in life 
in her life thus far and the life of all of my children. One of those horses at the school died. I don't know, you'd have to ask Temple what he died of, but it was a shock to Temple for the first time she saw the difference between life and death. The horse had died. That's where she learned about death. Just, I just wanted to let everybody know that the question that had been asked uh, was, was that people, I just, I wanted them to know yeah, that oh, yeah, many I may have people skipped, wrote yes, in yes. and said, how did you teach her about death? Because yeah, about that death. seems to be yes. a hard Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. because sometimes things are so clear in my own mind that I- Well, I think it was implied. Yeah, but, I think it was implied, but I, oh, I just good. wanted to share. So yes. many people are writing in and saying how inspirational you are too. I'm not going to interrupt you. You go right ahead. But I just wanted you to know that they're just loving you and oh, loving good. hearing about all oh, this. Oh, good. Because and she'll I continue to answer. some A lot yes, of the questions yes, that you guys yes, have written in, yes, um, she's answering as- As I've gone along. Uh, yes, that takes care of that question. Uh, he held her to all those duties. Now, Temple did get back to studying, uh, and it wasn't easy. She worked hard to get her through her high school training. Now she wanted to go to college. She was too anxious to take exams. How did she do it? This is where friendship between headmasters matter. Henry Patey and well, what's his name? Uh, Henry Frank DePietro was head of Hampshire, uh, was head of, uh, head of Franklin Pierce College. I'm trying to get these names straight here. The two organizations were not very far apart. Now they're both teachers, so naturally they know each other. Henry Patey went to Frank DePietro and explained about the fact she couldn't take an exam. It was too threatening. And they decided to choose. They chose to let Temple go to Franklin Pierce without exams. Let's try it and see how it works. Thank God. And it worked. They also decided that Temple would return every week to the Hampshire School for support of whatever kind she needed. And that worked too. It kept the two connections. All I can think of is every child on the spectrum needs a champion, maybe several champions at different stages in her life. And those two men were champions. Now she wanted to get her MA and Arizona State University had a math requirement and she couldn't carry it out. So between Franklin Pierce College and Arizona State University, they, they arranged a substitute course so she could get go on there. It didn't, it was not a good spell for Temple there at Arizona State University. This is what happens when people like the idea of helping autism and don't know anything about it. They, it was, they didn't know how to help her. They were not Henry Patey or Frank DePietro. So it was an uneasy time in Temple's life. She did get through and she did go on, bless her heart to get her PhD. God bless. Yeah, I mean, Temple, I, I'm so proud of you. I have a note here. I, let me just see if I answer my questions because our time, I'm fearful our time will run out. Let me see. I think it matters. Oh, what's my relationship to Temple today? It's, it's wonderful. We are friends and that means everything to me. And Temple called me the other day. Here we are all housebound. She said, mother, 
you know, her mother, what are you doing about food? And Mark, who lives on her property, he knew how to make a connection on the internet. I'm not clever with the internet for getting food to me here in New York. So between them, they arranged so that I could get food without having to go out and be endangered. Thank you, Temple. I really, really love it. And life is, the connections are amazing. The second time I did it, Mark called me on the phone. He said, well, the young man who's uh, going to bring you food lives in your apartment. We talked. The world is much smaller than we think, too. We talked. And I said, I would like to contribute to what you're doing. He said, you can't. It's just a bunch of young people who have nothing to do. They can't do their jobs. So they all decided between them they would shop, particularly for the elderly who shouldn't be going out. I don't know if that's happening in your community. Do you know if it is? Do you know? It, it, do you have that set up? Yes. I mean, across the, the country, there are so many um, people uh, who are, are volunteering it, and bringing yes, it's food. Bringing, yes, exactly. It's amazing. That's, well, that's what, and I love the fact that it turned up to be in my, in my in own apartment. <laughs> I love that too. Uh, let me just, I had a, wait a minute, have I got, oh. I think there's a question of, I mean, what would I say to teach parents about parenting? Yeah, is there something that you want parents, because they're asking again here well, too, they want to know what's the thing that you would tell uh, parents? What's the one uh, thing you would tell us? Make, uh, I'm back to choices. Make choices, don't, there are no answers. Make choices and if they don't work, change them. Try something else and pay attention. Learn, it's a learning job for both you and the child. And you'll get better at it. As you go along, as you get better, you'll get more courageous. You'll be more active. Uh, I want to cycle back to something. Uh, that now you, I have. Uh, okay. Some, I, I, I'm trying to tuck these things in. Where's quarter of, of and that's why. I time. To just let me slip in here, because I want to put together siblings and change. What would I change? Oh, I would change the way. I handled the siblings. They didn't get a fair shot at life. The problem for siblings is they, they be turned into little helpers and they're too young to know that it's depriving them of their own development, of their own sense of self. It takes a toll. I would change that now. Now I have learned since two things. One, always save some time for the sibling. Something you will do together alone. Something, it can be just everybody else out of the kitchen. We're gonna get dinner together. Something where you, you're not eyeball to eyeball, but an activity you do together. I love I loved the mother who said, Oh, it's easy. We go and get our toenails painted together. <laughs> uh, the other thing I would urge is a counselor. A child knows that parents are upset. They're much more aware than any of us are conscious of that as parents. They will tell a counselor what they won't tell their mother because they know it will upset their mother. They also are often too young to have any idea how to put it into words. I love the counselor who I met later in life, who had a huge dollhouse and every kind of imaginable character, animal, furniture. And she would say to the child, you can furnish the doll's house. 
She said the scenes they make tell her what the problem is. The other thing she did was, she said, I always make a little tent out of blankets and give the child a flashlight and say, you can go in, that's your tent. Then she said, I ask for permission to come in and join her. So together, the counselor and the child inside the little tent, she can then help the child to understand that she has a right to her own life. And that helps them to develop and rise above the differences. And also what I've run into is they know what's absurd about life in a way that other children don't. And we can all use a little of that. <laughs> so I think, I think I've covered the questions. I, can I just cycle back though too? Cause I think yes. there's a little bit of misunderstanding with at least one person. When you were talking in the beginning yes. about the, the lacks, the things that our children don't have, yes. I wanna make sure that people understand that you, you were advocating for early intervention there because they can learn those things. It's Absolutely. not game yes, over. I should, again, thank you, thank you. I, I realized I had skipped over, uh, I talked, I hadn't connected, talk about putting context together the relevance of education to overcome these gaps in their neurology. There, it's learnable. Yes, we had one adult who wrote in and said, wait a second, I understand the difference between the shovel and the sandbox and the shovel. And, and I, know, I know that they're both shovels. And I just wanna be clear with everybody that you weren't saying that that necessarily has to be across a lifetime, that, that individuals no. given yeah. the opportunity Children. early you're, to learn I, that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. They can learn it. And Temple has learned it. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, 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 and my point is, it, if you don't understand those points, you don't know to teach them. Yes. Early intervention. Early I think we can all, all, all let's agree Let's just here. embroider that on a pillow. Yes, let's absolutely embroider that on a pillow. Uh, okay. Did you, I know that yeah. you had some something you wanted to read. Is it time for yes. that or not? Okay. Yes, there is, because right. according to me, I've, we've timed it perfectly. Okay. okay, all right. So let me read Limbo. I looked up Limbo in Webster's Dictionary, and I found it describes the place where we parents of autistic children find we get stuck. Limbo is the abode of souls barred from heaven through no fault of their own, a place of confinement a place or condition of neglect or oblivion. We've all been there. That abode where we struggle with the needs of our child caused through no fault of our own or of our child's. A condition of social isolation, of neighborhood neglect or oblivion. Trapped, hedged in by a guilt that defies explanation, we accept what the world tells us we're supposed to feel. You must love your child, the world says, and intermittently we do. As my wise daughter-in-law said, it's easy to love people when they're lovable, not so easy when they're not. The inconstancy throws us off, floods us with a raging shame. Only in private do parents ever ask me if I got angry. What do I do with these feelings, they say? How do I take care of my child and hold myself together? They're old feelings, old questions. They turn up in Psalm 42. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou so disquieted within me? Long ago, I thought the Psalm was about those on the autism spectrum. Now I know the Psalm is about us. And with it comes another question. How do I cope with the physical task of caring for my child and at the same time present myself to the world as the world says I'm supposed to be? The world says my child is a gift, a special gift that will transform me into a deeper, more meaningful person. But it's not happening. My child is driving me crazy. 
my child is isolating me from the world. So in order to join the world and have my neighbors think well of me in place of love, I will substitute glory. I will glorify my child, praise every step forward. I will tell the world my child is special. And our children, trapped in autism self-absorption, assume the assigned role. In troth, we've given them no other choice. Out of our own need, we've created a role-playing partnership. Our children are special, we are noble. And neighbors, out of their need for approval, accept the partnership. They too find our children a handful. They too have feelings they don't want to say out loud. Thus, with mutual need, we construct limbo. We're all of us excused. We're all of us there through no fault of our own. The setup feels safe, but it's not. Limbo is a static condition, a place where nothing grows. It only repeats. Growth, real growth, takes courage, honesty, hard work, and insight. The setup reminds me of an old dog racing story back in the days when we used to race whippets. The oval track and the starting gate were the same as those of a horse race. Only instead of a jockey with a whip, there was a mechanical rabbit set to scamper ahead of the dogs, just always out of reach. In this race, the bell clanged, the gates opened and the dogs sprang out after the mechanical rabbit, all except for one dog. He stopped, he looked around the track, he saw that it circled around, he ran around the track the other way, he met the rabbit and chewed it up. He didn't win. Racetracks are about betting, not about intelligence or insight, and certainly not about love. But in my heart, he was the winner. We don't have to chase after the mechanical rabbit just because the other dogs do. Stop, take a look. Somewhere in that whippet reaction, and it's not the track we thought was laid out for us to run. We may not win the worldly bet, but we will escape from limbo. In the escape, we will find our child and ourselves. Where was hey. I? Let me... Go, you go right ahead. Just got one tag here for it. Where was I in all this? Temple, my darling, when you were born, I was very young. The world I came from, the world I married into, didn't ask for much from me, but social grace, the messy business of talent and passion, weren't encouraged. And autism, passion gone awry, it was hard to excuse. I had to risk rejection, and I was rejected. I had to search for myself, dig under the skin and touch the glossy viscera, looking for what constitutes being human. Autism was a way to learn, yes, but not enough. Acting and writing took me deeper. Singing was my ticket to what I needed to see and touch and feel and be a part of. In the locked wards of the veterans' hospitals, I sang for men who had lost their minds in the Korean War, that war between World War II and the war in Vietnam. Men who under the stress of battle's horror had become catatonic, who stood all day, rigid and worthless, wordless. I sang to them, if I knew you were coming out, I baked a cake. And here and there, I could see a foot tap, ever so slightly, but tapping. They were there, somewhere inside the horror. I sang in the wards for the men who had lost their faces and were waiting for the reconstructive surgery. They prayed would make them look human again. I studied autism and I studied retardation. I learned that nature can make cruel mistakes 
and the mistakes, however alarming, will live and talk and want attention and need love. I had to learn that madness and error are in us all, and it's only by a hair's breadth that we are who we are. There wow. We are. And they want to know what that is from, Eustacia. Those are your words. You wrote oh, I, them. That's, I wrote them. It's all yes. limbo I wrote and the last statement. They're all my own words. Amazing. Absolutely. And at the moment, I'm working on a book on the social history of autism. It's very old. We've always had it. And where do I find the best descriptions of it? In literature, books, novels, men who understood the best example is Dickens, Nicholas Nickleby. When you read it, you understand that Spike wasn't retarded, as he was called. He was autistic. He doesn't talk like a retarded person. Dickens was fought about this, and he justified what he had done. He had worked as a child of 12. He was put to work at a boot blacking factory where they employed children of all kinds of mental and physical difficulties. He knew what he was talking about. I think we now have used up all our time. We are we are so very close, but I want to I'm glad. Thank you for stopping for a second. I wish I could read everything um that you have written they wanted to know is limbo from a thorn in my pocket i want to make sure you no, guys know no it's not it's a blog <laughs> if they go to the temple grand and eustacia color autism uh fund website okay it's so on there these are blogs that i okay written, and there are a Holy... lot of other ones they're worth reading yes well they're i mean just, just yes. pieces that i wrote that seem to me to the point. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we want to make sure that you guys know you can also go to FH, which stands for Future Horizon yes, Autism, uh, FHAutism.com. Not only can you find a thorn in my pocket there, but you can find links to other things. And Eustacia is going to be doing a special um, Mother's Day event for Future Horizons, and information yeah. will be available yeah. on the website about that. Yes. You guys can check out it. Um, and I I want, I want to let you know. I think they're going to be, I, I, I will talk to Teresa, but I think they should be able to uh, connect to it. There we go. And, and I'm going to continue talking to you, Stacia, and we're, we, you know, we've got stuff in the works for you guys as well down the road. Yes. So, one and one, one and one. Yes. We will which do would, that. Which is very, very exciting. Um, but I just could weep because this has been such an amazing, wonderful thing to be a part of. And it's been so lovely getting to talk to you uh, as much as we got to talk this week. That has been um, honestly one of the most inspirational things in my life. See, I'm getting weepy. But uh, <laughs> Eustacia, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, like cut a, a lot of these wonderful things um, and paste them and send them to you so that you can send read some me. of the, send see the love me. that has been shed upon and you. Send, because... me, send me the questions. Yes, because that, I will. Then I have a feeling about what's on your mind, what's troubling yeah. you. And yeah. when there, we did today, we just picked out general questions that were yes. things that were pertinent to everybody but sometimes this is why i do one and one talks uh, people yeah. have individual problems that they need to talk out and, and then i just want one because i want to hear the website again for the foundation so it's the, the temple, temple the temple grand in eustacia cutler autism fund there we go and it's got uh, a website if you if you hit that uh, it'll come right up. Yeah. Right we up. also posted Limbo on our link last please, night. Oh, please you guys do. could yeah. read it. Um, so it was, it's there on our Facebook, um, on Autism I, Live's uh, Facebook. Yeah. And I also sent you the one about Ogden and the Uncertainty Principle, yes. didn't I? Uh, and, which is a good a situation where the little boy who had Asperger was much smarter 
than the doctors. They didn't yeah. pick up. The doctors didn't get what was troubling him. And I, I thought this is where uh, why I also feel it's, it's a double problem. It's not only does your child need your help, but so does the public need your help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I just want to thank all of you for being here. I feel like we've all been a part of something really incredible today. And thank you for making that possible for us, Eustacia. Um, we are going to be back on Monday and we have a whole array of shows for you next week because we're finishing April strong. I just want to give you an idea. We've got special education attorney Bonnie Yates with us on Monday. Alex Lynn, self-advocate from Autism Rocks. On Tuesday, we have Anita Lesko, self-advocate and author, talking about nutrition and her new book, The Food Revolution. On Wednesday, Dr. Doreen Grampiche answers your questions. And on Thursday, we're going to finish out the month of April with self-advocate uh, Chelsea Darnell. It's going to be an amazing. And then on Friday, we have uh, Elaine Hall from The Miracle Project joining us. I don't know if you saw on the Today Show, they were featuring yesterday, The Miracle Project. And Autism the Musical Part 2 is premiering on HBO on Tuesday. She's going to talk with us about that. So, uh, Eustacia, thank you so much for being here and thank all of you. We are going to be back on Monday. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Eustacia. Bye. Mwah. Love thanks, you so. Thanks to you all. Thank you. Bye-bye, yeah. everybody. Have Bye -bye. a good weekend. Thank you, Eustacia.